Our souls are hungry for peak states and it's our birthright to feel them every day. And it's not just for magical people. It's not just for navel gazers. It's not just for economically privileged people. Like we all fucking deserve to be in ecstasy every day and our nervous systems were built for that. And so when I had that experience of like, oh, this is in all of us, I was like, why aren't we all doing this all the time? Welcome to Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? I'm Emily Fletcher and I believe that bliss is your birthright. That's why I'm calling on my world-class network to uncover the most potent, spine-tingling, even taboo healing modalities, all so you can reclaim your bliss. Let's do this. You've heard me talk about today's guest so many times in email, on other podcasts, on social media. This person has changed my life so deeply, created so much more magic and beauty and possibility, and honestly helped me to wake up to the true essence of who I really am. In addition to being my best friend, she also went to Stanford. She also studied Tantra in the jungles of Asia for 19 years. She's been studying this stuff. She has reached over 120 million people through her YouTube channel. She has 325,000 people who read her beautiful emails every week. She's trained over 12,000 men, women, and non-binary people to be sex, love, and relationship coaches. When she teaches, she channels the ancestors, the enlightened masters, And when I looked deeply into her eyes for the first time, I felt like I could see all of the many, many lifetimes that we had shared together. She is as audacious as she is brilliant. She is as fun as she is kind. And today we talk about everything from our first meeting to our second date to exactly what Tantra is and how we can actually find God inside of everything. So buckle up. This is a beautiful, heart-filled, mind-exploding episode with my best friend and the founder of Vita Coaching, Layla Martin. Layla Martin, I love you. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello, you thank you. Thank you for being the kind of best friend that introduces me in a way that makes me cry. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I love you so much. And I'm so outrageously grateful for every gift that you've ever given to me. And I'm proud of myself for making it through that intro without crying. <laughs> but here we go. <laughs> we got you now. <laughs> Oh, it's just so true. Like when I think about who I was three years ago before I met you, it was a totally different version of me. And people see it. They look at even a photo of me online and like you look like a totally different person. And it's it's not exclusively because but so much of it I can attribute to the doors that you have unlocked inside of my heart, inside of my pleasure, inside of my essence. So thank you for reminding me what is possible. Thank you for being a living, breathing permission slip and for living such an audacious life of service. Well, it's it's amazing because I have been witness to that level of quantum transformation in you and how much you have just said yes and owned it and embodied it and been fierce and brave and courageous in ways that have blown my mind. Mm-hmm. You know, you have inspired me to be even more courageous in how I speak and how I bring these practices to the world. But one of the things that I think is so important to say for everyone is I feel like like I lit myself up as a high priestess, right? And as like a living remembrance of what any woman could be or a person of any gender who remembers their own divinity. And it's like... And is that how you would define a high priestess? Someone who remembers their own divinity? Yes, okay, absolutely. And then mm-hmm. holds ritual space for anyone, whether it's, you know, paid people or just the people they love in their life to remember as well. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you, all of us, in some way, shape, or form are waiting for that permission slip, for Mm -hmm. that transmission where we get to say yes. And so it's like a combination of finding like a living embodiment, whether it's a text, a body of work, a living human who reminds us of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And then what you brought so wholeheartedly to it, which is like a full fuck yes, a yes, a yes, a yes, a yes, right? Because like I take zero responsibility for all the work you put in saying yes every moment to becoming this bold embodiment of what you are. Like it's lifetimes that made you as wise and as deep in this work as you are Mm -hmm. and the courage in this lifetime to say yes and to listen to the calling of meeting me because all of us here have had that moment, right, of, of finding someone that we're like, oh, this person or this teacher, this body of work, this is like a calling. Mm-hmm. And then we get the choice to say yes or not. Mm. Well, 
Yeah, and it's, so it's like they, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, right? Yeah. That's the sort of cliche. But then you have to choose to go down it. You have to choose yeah. to do the work. You have to choose to say yes. And I think especially in these arenas of, you know, historically very taboo topics, historically very um, shamed topics or things that are supposed to be private or that are called dirty or bad or wrong or so much conditioning that we're swimming in that I could imagine that when you started doing this work, 10, 15, how long ago did you start teaching? 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Yeah. That it was a very different world, that mm -hmm. it was much thicker in these realms than it is now. Because it feels like now that we're on this precipice of this new yeah. sexual revolution, yeah. which is really exciting. Yeah. And so I'm not getting the same headwind that you likely had 15 years ago. And so I would just love to, to roll the tape back a bit, mm -hmm. not all the way back, which we will. But when was the moment for you where you had such a profound experience in, in, in studying Tantra or in sacred sexuality where you were like, why isn't everyone doing this? Like, this is so good. <laughs> like, I have to bring this to the world. Like, what was that for you? Yeah. So I received, I, I was uh, going to a Tantra school. So I had been studying Tantra actually for about five years at that time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to like dedicate my life to it. So it's like I had done some workshops, some retreats. I'd learned practices. I'd worked with some teachers. I was going back and forth between being in Asia and being at Stanford. And I went to Asia permanently or like what was like a permanent move at the time mm -hmm. for like, I want to find Tantra. And I found this school. Um, they were actually abusive and corrupt in their own way. <laughs> it, it happened. So I'm not gonna. Is, I'm not gonna talk about the school. So you don't need it. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, and in that program, so it was a it was a five year program. I did three and a half years. And in the first month, um, you receive a, a mantra initiation. So it's like a classical practice. Um, you teach it in your own meditation work, right? Like using mm -hmm. mantra to activate energy. Mm -hmm. And so, just to define, in case people are new, so mantra, m Sanskrit word, man means mind, trap means vehicle. So yeah. this is a oftentimes Sanskrit term, not always, but something that takes the mind from one state of consciousness to another. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so I was receiving a Shiva mantra. So what that means is a, a sound activation, mm -hmm. uh, a mantra that would make my mind the vehicle of Shiva consciousness, which in the tantric tradition is the presence, right? When we say presence, uh, when we're learning to meditate or when we're talking about cultivating presence in our life, in the tantric tradition, presence goes all the way back to source consciousness. So presence is an expression of original source consciousness. Mm. And so receiving a Shiva mantra is to receive a sound vibration that will carry your mind into the essence of source consciousness, source presence. Mm. And so when I received that in a very classical way, a teacher touching my third eye and giving me the mantra, and then I meditated on it for 30 minutes, like it was better than any drug I'd ever taken. And I was quite adventurous. I went to Ibiza <laughs> when I was 17. I was like on the MDMA, dancing to Paul Oakenfield, literally getting thrown out of like 10,000 person fancy clubs in Europe. Cause I was like, you know, a white girl, like European, just like being like, wow. And they're like, this is classy, man, get out. <laughs> this is why we're besties. You know? <laughs> Woo. So like, I knew what drugs felt like. And I was like, oh, God feels better than any drug. God feels better than any drug. Woo! <laughs> And so I remember afterwards, I had this amazing boyfriend. His name was Ryan and he loved me and we had motorbikes because it was Thailand. And I like, I got this initiation and I just wanted to like fly. The whole world was made of magic and color and beauty and freedom. And it was so amazing. It was like being high on God. It was the best feeling in the whole universe. And so I got on the back of his motorbike and he had this like chiseled body. He was like this runner and boxer. And he like <laughs> took me to the Thai market and I ate a papaya salad. And it was just like every flavor was like bursting out. I could feel the consciousness of all the fish and the animals in the market. Like I was so connected. Nature came alive. It was so vibrant. And, and this was right after the activation, right? It was right after, after the activation. So okay. I received the activation. Then we like went on this like joy ride. And I was like, oh, like tapping into God consciousness is better than any drug I've ever taken. Wow. And in that, I was like, oh, like, 
why aren't we all doing this? Why are we not connecting in such a way that this activation of the depth and beauty of life is something that we connect to every day? Mm-hmm. And there was a youthful, and I say youthful both in how young I actually was, but also on the spiritual path of eventually, right, you come to realize that spirituality is all the states, Mm -hmm. right? And because historically now, many of us are in cultures where, as you were talking about, the practices that give us direct access to that God consciousness, not listening to someone tell us what God is, not having someone tell us who we have to be to access what we already are, Mm. but going directly there because those practices, right? Mantras, breath work, plant medicines, ecstatic rituals, sacred sexuality, cathartic rituals have been, we've been taught that those are bad or wrong or shameful, even Mm anti-religious. A lot of us have been denied that inner access to that world of like rich magic. And I believe that even though spirituality is so much more than just touching those peak states, I know that it's so much more than touching those peak states, that our souls are hungry for peak states and it's our birthright to feel them every day. And it's not just for magical people. It's not just for navel gazers. It's not just for economically privileged people. Like we all fucking deserve to be in ecstasy every day and our nervous systems were built for that. Whether by awe of nature or incredibly intimate sexuality with a partner or with ourselves, with energy work, with being able to connect with a deeper reality. And so when I had that experience of like, oh, this is in all of us, I was like, why aren't we all doing this all the time? Yeah. And the funny thing is I went home to New York City like probably a year later and I tried to tell everyone. I was like, like in the, I'd be in the back of taxi cabs and I'd be like, did you know that magic is real? I'd be like, sir, sir. Have you just really quick, if you experienced God consciousness and might I give you this mantra? I know it's not really like a ritual setting, but you know. <laughs> I was like, you know Star Wars? I was like, you know how the, all the stuff about like the energy and the hero's journey and the like getting to like find out what you're made of? I was like, it's real. <laughs> you can go to the jungle and make it real. And it was like, like people didn't want to know, right? Like they yeah. just, you were asking like what was different in the consciousness back then? No one cared. I was like, what? I was like, but but so many of us are suffering, lonely, hungering. We want to know that we're that magical inside and we all are. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and there's, there's a way. And I was like, damn, no one cares. All right. So I I did stop talking about it to that level, but I love the, the 24 year old who was just like, (laughs) da da da. I was like, anybody, anybody. Is this this thing on? Is this thing on? (laughs) Hey, you guys, God is right inside of you. You're, a- you're actually God. I you're actually God. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, but you, you are. <gasps> okay, so this so so this feels like a beautiful, very clear, like, why isn't everyone doing this? So I would love to answer that question. So why isn't everyone doing this? Uh, because, and I know that this is a long... Actually, I want to wait on that because I want people to understand what the this is that we're talking about yep. fully before uh. we talk about the, yeah, I get it, Layla. And this is the cathartic rituals that we were talking about <laughs> earlier. <laughs> So I want to, I want people to really understand that this before we get to the why people aren't. Yeah. So how would you, just to keep it really simple, because I, I mean, if you had asked me three years ago what Tantra is, I probably would have given you a really inaccurate or very simple response. So can you give us like the simple definition of Tantra? Yes. So Tantra is a spiritual tradition Mm -hmm. that is founded on the deep inner realized truth that everything is God consciousness, everything without exception. And how, what is, what's God consciousness? God consciousness uh, <laughs> is the thing. <laughs> the unknowable, the unnameable, the yeah. everythingness. <laughs> Emily Fletcher, did you just ask me to define the thing that not a single human in history has been able to give? I mean, you did just take a full stack of moods, so I have faith in you. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone can do it, you can. <laughs> All right, let me let me take a stab at the thing that like all of humans have like basically like not been able to encapsulate. I will tell you what it feels like to me. Okay. Feels like in the stillest, truest place of my being, 
I can feel the ground, which is like, it's like an emptiness and a fullness at the same time. Mm. And it gives birth, rise to everything that can be experienced. And while it's like unknowable and unspeakable in language, it's something that can be like intimately felt because it's literally the source of anything and everything that can be experienced. It's always right there. It's simultaneously something like so intimate and so simple. And yet the infinite profound source of absolutely everything. And so God consciousness, when I said earlier, consciousness is, is presence, awareness. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's aware that, Mm. that source, that stillness is aware. And it's literally in absolutely everything. And so when I say that, one of the reasons why that can sound familiar to some of us who have done spiritual practice is because Hatha yoga comes from the tantric tradition. So the teaching that all is one actually has its roots in the tantric tradition. Mm. So a couple of things I want to underline. So I love that you said like the everythingness and the nothingness, that you're feeling that simultaneously. And I would just interject my definition of God because I know that even that word God can be triggering for yes. folks, especially like I was raised Southern Baptist and so that that word I had to reclaim for myself. Yeah. But I would define God as the collective consciousness of all that is, every cell in your body, every planet in our solar system, every solar system in the galaxy, every human on this planet, the collective consciousness of all that is. Yeah. And what I've been learning from you and what you are a living example of and what I've learned from you that that is the definition of Tantra is that that God is in absolutely everything, not just love and light and prayers on Sunday at church, but in your toenails and your icky conversations that you don't want to have with your best friend and in the booze and in the dirt and in the poop and in all of it. Yeah. It's in your menstrual blood. It's in your thoughts. (laughs) It's in the places you don't want to go. Mm -hmm. It's in cemeteries. And that is what, when I first recognized I was a tantrika, it was because when I read, it it was a text of a book I was reading in India at the time, Um, you know, the tantrikas are the people who go where it's hardest to love God and find devotion there. Mm. And so... Tantrikas, which is like a practitioner of tantra. Yeah. The people who go where it's hardest to find God and find it there. Yes. Whoa. And so this other beautiful thing about the tantric tradition is that that realization, right, that everything is one, many cultures, many people have realized that globally, right? And I would argue my sense is is that humans actually knew that as a living truth if you go far enough back in any society. Yeah, almost every civilization. You go back to the indigenous culture and they're practicing some form of worshiping the animals, the planets, the stars, like, yeah. Yes. Connecting with nature. Yes. Mm-hmm. What I love about the tantric tradition, so I, I think there's there's two things, is one, that it is highly evolved in my opinion in that it's been there for thousands of years and was deeply intact and it was pan-Asian, meaning that it was practiced in Tibet. It was practiced in various forms in China. It was practiced in Bhutan, which is actually still uh, a tantric kingdom. So Mm. the rulers of Bhutan are tantric practitioners. That's why when you hear, like, we don't care about gross domestic product, we care about gross domestic happiness. And people are like, what leadership would say that? And you're like, tantric leadership? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I did not know that. Yeah, Nepal used to be tantric Uh until it was overthrown, uh, that that, um, leadership. And so... It, it permeated Asia and the, the hub of it, the birthplace and the place where it was cultivated in a very profound way is in India. Mm-hmm. And the way that the teachers of the tantric tradition preserved the tradition, uh, there are so many texts, deep, rich, incredible, mind-blowing texts from this tradition, practices that many of us even, those of us who are listening who are Western practitioners, not of Indian heritage, we received the bounty and blessing of this Indian heritage through practices uh, like Hatha Yoga, like Pranayama, like 
uh, deep forms of meditation, which you can find all over Asia, but many mm -hmm. of them actually come from the tantric tradition. Things like chakras, mm -hmm. uh, kundalini. The Saraswati lineage. I'm from, uh, like, yeah, and also I just want to highlight that also one of the reasons why so many of these practices we attribute to being Indian in nature is that geographically it was protected. Yes. There's two oceans on the bottom, two mountain ranges on the top, so it was hard to invade. So it's not that, like, if, if other countries had not been colonized or invaded, we might have been attributing these practices to some other lineage. Yeah. I mean, what's amazing about India, because actually India was colonized both uh, by Islamic colonization and then British colonization. It was, but not for a long time. Like not until we had the technology to go into ships and to traverse those mountains, like for many thousands of years before we had that technology, it stayed pure. And then they had the foresight to know to like put this knowledge into the mountains, into like the monastics, so that when people, when we started to get overtaken, that the knowledge did not get destroyed. That I would say is more, to me, that's why India maintained this, is their deep commitment to their spiritual heritage even mm -hmm. in the face of colonization yeah because it's been you know 700 years in some places of india before they they have colonization so it actually did deeply disrupt tantric transmission sure and actually make like one of the reasons why it's hard to find living tantric masters right now is actually because of colonization in india mm -hmm. and the tradition remained way more intact than in other places in the world in my opinion and as, as you're saying due to indian cultural dedication to spiritual transmission, to the culture being in such deep service to their spirituality in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, but you could argue many cultures had that. So there's there's just, it's, it's in a way what I'm trying to instill in us is this awe of the culture that birthed Tantra, because yeah. sometimes we forget that mm -hmm. if we're not from that culture. And it's so incredibly important. And so for me, the tantric tradition has all these tools and practices. So it's not just a philosophy. They're not just telling you all is one. They're saying, I have experienced all is one, but here are the tools and techniques. Here's the technology for you to realize that all is one. And that is available to us because of the preserved tradition mm -hmm. and not all traditions got preserved to that degree, sadly, mm -hmm. uh, globally. So it's got that going for it. And the other thing that I love is when you're looking for traditions to engage in, it's like, what makes your heart beat? What brings you alive. And for me, the tantric tradition, it's like, there's the 64 tantric arts. It's like, how do you bring God consciousness into the way you decorate your home, mm. into the way that you eat, into the way that you make love? There is a passion and a poetry and an elegance and a fierceness to the tantric tradition that has always spoken to me, mm. that makes me fall in love so that I want to do the practices. And so there's something so elegant and beautiful for me about their tradition and at the same time, the truth that they are pointing to is eternal and now and beyond any cultural trappings, any story of mind. It's a path to get there. But once you're there, it's it's total freedom. Mm, I love that. So I'm going to say back what I heard is that the knowledge itself, the tools themselves, they are pointing to universal truths. Yes. And those truths do, are transcend certainly country lines, cultural lines. And yet we all owe deep respect, deep reverence to the dedication of thousands and thousands of years of teacher to student and to the people who had the foresight to know that this knowledge above all needs to be protected even in face of the colonization. Absolutely. So I love that simultaneity of revering the culture that has preserved it and remembering that it is not... It's not an Indian truth. It's not an Indian practice. It's not just for Indian people. If it's if God is everywhere, that includes all races, all nationalities, all people, all animals, all planets. Yeah. And also you can look to the tradition and generally, I mean, the tantric tradition is diverse. Things are always changing. I cannot speak for what will happen in Indian culture generally, but the tantric tradition did teach like we... In general, we are happy to initiate foreigners. We are happy to initiate people of all castes because there was this desire similar to Buddhism, similar to Christianity of like, this wisdom is so good, mm -hmm. share it with people. So when you look at the originating teaching of a tradition mm -hmm. of do we want this to spread, that's very important and yeah. how you engage with the tradition and whether it is respectful to study and engage with it or not. Yeah, thank you for speaking that because like my teacher's teacher's teacher, like on his deathbed, like looked at my teacher's teacher and was like, you speak English. Yeah. Like he was highlighting, like you speak English, like go to America. Because yeah. right at that point in history, India was looking to America for cultural cues. Yes. Coca-Cola, movies. And it was like, okay, go take this knowledge to America because that is actually how it's going to come back to India. Yeah. 
So yeah. thank you for honoring that as well. So many amazing Indian teachers came starting in the 1920s as emissaries from the Indian government. They actually paid for them to come. So it was there were there were waves upon waves of Indian masters who came and conscientiously spread this wisdom to the West by that very directive so mm -hmm. that this incredible wisdom tradition could change planetary consciousness, but also so that people would respect the incredible power of Indian culture. And that has happened in many ways. Like we all know yoga, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know in many ways, like, you know, many of us have heard of meditation traditions, practices that have come from India. It was mm -hmm. very intentional. And so it's really beautiful that they had this calling and directive to bring us these incredible wisdom practices. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deep reverence and gratitude. <laughs> um, okay. So can you just speak to when people, and when they hear that word Tantra, we, we can't help but think like Tantra equals sex. And so now in this definition where you're saying like that God is everywhere, even in the darkest of the places. So I would love to connect those dots because that's something to me that feels like I really want to dive in with you of like why and when did sex become a dark place that it would be hard to find God? Yes. Right? Yes. Um, so what is beautiful in the tantric tradition and why I teach predominantly sexual practices, even mm -hmm. though the tradition is vast and so far beyond that, is because in the tradition, it is taught that when you go to places that you have the most shame, the most conditioning, the most rejection, the most God is not there, and you go there, mm -hmm. you can have some of the fastest awakening. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the cool, like, if you want to say like every sort of spiritual tradition has its like PR marketing technique of like why you should practice with us. The tantric tradition is like, look, you want to be awakened in a single lifetime, like hop on, hop on board with us. Right. And it's a rapid form of awakening because it's willing to go where our illusions are the deepest and the thickest, where the stories we tell ourselves are the most mired in ego. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you look at the tantric tradition, it both embraced sexuality as a path to God, because everything can be a path to realization, right? You can use the way that you eat as a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. You can use meditation as a spiritual practice. You can use mantra as a spiritual practice. You can also use ecstatic dance as a spiritual practice. You can use motherhood as a spiritual practice. You can also use fucking as a spiritual practice. And one of the things that I like to say is that meditation is the still form of sex and sex is the active form of meditation. Mm. So everything that you can experience and realize in meditation, you can experience and realize in sex. And some people are like, wait, how? And it's like, well, you could have just been sitting in your chair, but now you're meditating, right? You could have just been having everyday sex, but now you're having sacred sexual realizations, right? Mm. It's about the intention. It's about the tools and techniques. It's about the practices. So you can actually take this space and utilize the energy of it, the, the container of it, mm -hmm. to have just as many spiritual awakenings as you would in any other spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. What I love and what can be very uh, tantric about using sexuality is right now in our culture, you go right to the heart of where many of us have been told that God is not, right? Mm -hmm. It's the opposite. Sex is the opposite of worship. Sex is the opposite of God. We've been programmed to believe that. And so to go there is to actually learn how many illusory stories we tell ourselves <laughs> that just aren't true. Mm. And to your question, it's not an accident that we've been taught that. So if you go back thousands of years in most cultures, but I will speak to the culture of the Middle East and Europe, Goddess worship, which was pervasive at the time, was often characterized by erotic rituals, ecstatic practices, emotional release, mm. catharsis, right? So right now, if we would think of, okay, if you want to go worship, right, you're going to put on white, you're going to pray, maybe you'll fast, you'll be in silence, right? This is how you get to God. This is a pathway to God, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thousands of years ago, you could also get to God. We'll say God, goddess, right? Whatever gender you want to give it. Mm -hmm. You could get to that through ecstatic dance, through erotic activation, through taking plant medicine. Those practices in many ways open and activate a level of sovereignty, empowerment, and self-remembrance that is wildly profound in a person. 
And so there is this amazing book right now, The Immortality Key. And it is... (laughs) Thank you for letting me borrow it this morning. (laughs) Very excited right now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's written by Brian... Uh Oh, I'm forgetting the name. Certainly don't know. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll put in the show notes. Immortality Key by Brian Someone Awesome. Brian Someone Awesome. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) bless that man. Like, bless that man. So he is, you know, an ordained priest. He's actually never done plant medicine. Um, He did research in uh, the Vatican Library. He did this very, very well-researched, thought-out book. And basically, he says it's pretty much undeniable that the foundation of Western civilization and so much that we respect in our legal system, in democracy that came from the Greek tradition and then was furthered um, in the Roman Empire, uh, was birthed by people who were regularly taking plant medicine sacraments and doing ecstatic rites and rituals as part of their spiritual realization. Okay, so can we, what would be a plant medicine ritual and what would be an ecstatic ritual? like? So a plant medicine ritual would be to intentionally take anything Mm -hmm. um, that will bring you into an altered state of consciousness. And so there's some debate on what that was. It Mm -hmm. was possibly natural forms of LSD uh, that came from grain and the way that they could actually bring um, the ergot off of the grain and make psychedelic substances. Mm -hmm. Um, It could have been from psilocybin, natural growing mushrooms. So Mm -hmm. people don't know for sure exactly what it was yet. But like intentionally communing with plants to find more expanded or altered state of consciousness. Yes. So this combined with ecstatic rituals. Yes. And you're saying that the entire, like maybe not the entire, but many of the things that we respect in Western culture, legal system, religious rituals were born out of people communing with plants and doing ecstatic rituals. Yes. And this was discovered by a dude who was an ordained priest who was researching in the Vatican library. Yes. Cool. Please continue. (laughs) (laughs) The book is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) So what this leads to is that even early Christianity, right, was likely the the original sacrament of early Christianity was a form of plant medicine offered as communion by female spiritual leadership. So women were an integral part of the early Christian church as spiritual leaders. And in serving Holy Communion, the idea was that people were able to self-realize their own nature, right? And I remember this. I was raised Catholic. I remember discovering the Book of Thomas, right? It was a gospel that was written at around the same time as the other gospels and removed from the canonical Bible by the Catholic Orthodoxy. And in the Book of Thomas, there's the teaching, like Jesus is within you, Mm. right? Like we actually are the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so that got removed from the tradition. So what happened is systematically, as religion became less about truly supporting people to wake up to the sovereign mystical truth of their own beings all of the practices that let people unequivocally self-realize were not only removed, but started to be characterized as demonic, wrong, bad, anti-religious. Dangerous. Dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we have inside of our nervous systems, many of us, generations, sometimes thousands of years of conditioning, that these practices, which are our birthright, deep breathing, even meditation, right? Like meditation seems so mainstream right now. 20 years ago, for a lot of people, it was straight witchcraft. I know. know. 13 years ago when I started teaching, my ex-husband would not say that I was a meditation teacher at a cocktail party because it was like too weird. It was too woo-woo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even meditation, right, which you can self-realize through meditation, Mm -hmm. was considered bad, wrong, suspect Mm -hmm. through a lot of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. So we've slowly started to re-engage with these practices culturally, Mm -hmm. right? So we started to re-engage with meditation, re-engage with yoga, right? Mm -hmm. Re-engage like body movements of any kind that alter your consciousness. We're having a huge revolution right now of the return of psychedelics Mm -hmm. and those becoming accepted again in mainstream culture. But again, 15, 20 years ago, you did ayahuasca. People would, right? Now it's like so cool to Mm -hmm. go and actually partake of ayahuasca in some circles, right? And it's starting to spread and receive widespread 
um, you know, scientific and research backed attention. And finance and legal support, like probably within the next 12 months, psilocybin yeah. and MDMA will be legal. Yeah. Already ketamine is legal. They're using it with PTSD and, um, and veterans. So yeah. like we've really made a lot, a lot of progress of reconnecting with these practices. And take a moment to really think that like at John Hopkins Medical University, they are finding that when people take psilocybin, in the vast majority of cases, it is not only one of the most significant experiences of their entire life, but they quit smoking at rates that they've never seen before, mm-hmm. right? That it heals depression mm-hmm. and anxiety at like unbelievable rates. It's this, it's it's not a Suicide magical Suicide is cure-all, going down. But it's so supportive to society. Mm-hmm. Western civilization is one of the only societies in the history of the world that has systematically denied people access to plant medicine on threat of death or being jailed for thousands of years. We're only now starting to reclaim it and think of how many people could have been so healed by this, so supported by this. Same with meditation, right? Like what could our great grandparents have done with the power of meditation, Mm. right? Sexual practices are the same. They got the same categorization as like bad, wrong, evil, dangerous, scary. So your work so far has been bringing meditation back into people's lives, right? Demystifying it, making it safe and okay for people to remember their true nature. Mm -hmm. Now you're feeling called to spread beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. To bring the erotic into your work, to bring even deeper activation for people's remembrance. My calling has been in this distinct sexual arena so that people can remember their own power, their own sovereignty, their own truth. And same as when we get denied meditation, we got denied inner peace, Mm. right? When we got denied psychedelics, we got denied healing from addiction, healing from some of these very persistent mental health issues, right? Really deep things we got denied. When we got denied access to the depth of these erotic practices, we forgot how powerful and intimate and profound and ecstatic true lovemaking can be. And it is haunting our marriages. Mm -hmm. It is haunting our partnerships. Mm -hmm. It is even haunting our dating, right? People now get addicted to pornography. Mm -hmm. They get super shut down. They start to blame themselves, right? I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my relationship. We don't even realize the degree to which this level of sexual repression has coded our nervous systems Mm -hmm. so that we are terrified of the ecstatic orgasmic expression of our own beings. And it might sound mystical and esoteric, esoteric the way that we are framing it. But the truth is, is that it is a mystical, spiritual problem all the way back at the roots. When you go back thousands of years, this split of thinking that my sexual nature is somehow the opposite of holy. How can you go all the way in on that? But it has the most practical outcome, which is that your nervous system is terrified to have the depth of wild orgasm that you are capable of. Your nervous system, I see so many men, they've been so coded to disconnect from their true sexual essence that pornography becomes their outlet and that trains their nervous system over a lifetime to dissociate and experience sex through their minds rather than their bodies and their hearts, Mm. right? So many women are so terrified of being slut shamed, of being a whore, of being kicked out of society should they dare to embrace their erotic nature. That doesn't just go away when you grow up. It actually gets deeper and more encoded in your nervous system unless you systematically release it. Mm -hmm. So, so much of our sexual expression goes back to our nervous systems and our nervous systems currently are telling the story of repression, pain, fear, and threat of death from the last few thousand years. Mm -hmm. So if we want to unleash and unlock that, what we have to do is recognize where the problem came from why we've been taught not to go there. Mm -hmm. And then when we get the courage to go there, to use tools and technology to unlock, activate, and release our erotic nature, if for no other reason than to have the most epic sexuality with our beloved that we possibly can with ourselves, because it's just something to have (laughs) on your bucket list. (laughs) And if you really want to, it'll take you all the way back to God consciousness. Mm. Mm, mm. Layla Martin, ladies and gentlemen, Layla Martin. 
Uh, watching you teach, watching the transition flow through you, like you are a living embodiment of this work, right? Mm -hmm. You have plugged yourself into the divine so many times that she flows so beautifully through you. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things that I want to underline inside of that. But the one is like, why were we taught that sex was somewhere that we should not go? And But before we do that, I want to just share a story of one of the first times that you initiated me into these practices. Yeah. Because, you know, I mentioned in the intro that the first time that I ever had that thought of like, why isn't everyone doing this was the first day of my meditation class. Mm. And when I find something that works, like I cannot help myself. Like I shout it from the rooftops. I get on the megaphone. I get on every podcast. I know I'm like, check out Layla. Um, but the second time it happened was when you started facilitating what you call sex magic, what has been called sex magic, what I am lovingly trying to rebrand as pleasure prayer for the newer audience that we're just using our prayer, using our pleasure to pray. Yeah. Um, so we're in Tulum. It's our second date. We've just met previously. Um, and was is pretty brave of us to be like, Hey, it's the middle of COVID lockdown. Let's go to Tulum with seven almost strangers. And yeah, we spent like a few days together. Like, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go on an international destination from which no one can escape easily. Like a vacation. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we go and I think, so my, my partner, Adam and I facilitated something during the day and we were all really like, Layla, will you please facilitate? And I remember there was a little hesitancy there. Like that, thus forward, you hadn't really facilitated outside of your containers where people were your official students. It was unusual to do in co-ed settings. And so we did this where you were inviting us to have a prayer, like something that we wanted to create in our lives and then use our pleasure to build through this process and then almost devote and dedicate the pleasure to the dream. But before we ever started any pleasure, you had each of us pleasure ourselves while the other six people in the room were celebrating and yesing us. And my whole body has goosebumps right now because... I imagine if I was listening to this, if Emily Fletcher was listening to this four years ago, I'd be like, nope, turn it off. No, thank you. That sounds like some crazy heathen, it's too scary for me. No, thank you. But every single time I've seen you teach or facilitate since, you do not even start the pleasure practice until you do some sort of a reclamation, some sort of an acknowledgement of these tens of thousands of years of programming and conditioning and shame that we have inherited and that we have absorbed into ourselves. Yeah. And so thank you for that um, impeccable container that you hold. Thank you for acknowledging that and also teaching people how to transmute it, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so we did this practice. It was beautiful. It was profound. And at the end, I'm, I'm lying in this post-climactic, blissful, connected, uh, holy state of consciousness, holding the vision of my dream. And I remember thinking, why isn't it? everyone doing this. It felt like the most natural, normal, holy, pure thing that I had ever experienced. And then you said, as you were giving us an intro, you said for tens of thousands of years, ecstasy was used as a purifying force. And I cannot unhear that sentence. For tens of thousands of years, ecstasy was seen as a purifying force. So how and why and when did it get turned into this villain that would keep us from God? Yeah. I'm really asking. <laughs> it wasn't hypothetical. <laughs> it was not rhetorical. She wants to know, yo. Oh, no. And I know you touched on it, that like of the profundity of like women leading ecstatic rituals, women giving plant medicine yeah. in these, like in even church settings. Yeah. So can you just walk us through, like even if it's brief, yeah. like how did it become so quote unquote dangerous or demonic? Like how did we manage to forget that not only can we access the divine yeah. through our pleasure, but that we are the divine. Yeah. I mean, I don't actually know like the deepest, true, historical, absolute roots of that. What I can tell is that there was a pretty systematic removal and denial of people's access to the practices that not only reminded them that they were God, all throughout Europe and then European culture influenced everyone else through colonization and through just cultural impact. Um, but that the patriarchal religions went to war with the goddess religions. Like they were literally competitors. The patriarchal religions went to war with the goddess religions. Yes. Okay. So um, Judaism, Christianity, um, they basically, uh, as they started to spread, were 
in competition with people who worshiped the goddess because pagan traditions worshiped goddesses as well as gods. And so in the domination of those religious practices, one of the fastest ways to get rid of them was to actually um, say that your practices are demonic, your practices are evil. So even the reason that Satan looks like um, a goat, which isn't in the Bible, Mm -hmm. is because that was Dionysus. Mm. That was Pan. And the rites and worship of Dionysus and Pan, both pagan gods, were often facilitated by female priestesses, and they were ecstatic. They used Meaning libations. using your ec- ecstasy. ecstasy. Yes, mm-hmm. they were cathartic. They mm-hmm. were wild. And they often used libation, whether it was alcohol or other plant sacraments, as a way to commune with the God. Mm-hmm. And so as Christianity spread throughout Europe, it was very hard to stamp out the worship of Dionysus and Pan. And so they literally turned Dionysus into Satan. Wow. It was a very amazing PR tool. Now, if I want to give the most compassionate understanding of the people doing that, I think in some ways was it a feeling of let's you know deny people their sovereign access to God. Probably it wasn't that intentional. Probably it was a genuine belief that people weren't smart enough and capable enough to know that level of power within themselves. Hmm. There was a genuine belief that there was something wrong and scary about those practices and a feeling of we need to convert those people. And we believe strongly that there is good and evil, right and wrong, and their nature worshiping ecstatic loving rites are scary and dangerous. But also when they're doing those, they don't go and listen to the priests. So let's make those wrong and bad probably because we feel like they are. But what that did is it systematically shut down a deep part of us because celebrating life, being in ecstatic communion with nature, being able to worship the divine through life itself is so sacred and nourishing and healing to the human body and the human system. Mm -hmm. So when we made those wrong, we also started to deny and disconnect from massive parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And to me, this has, has contributed vastly to the rampant illnesses and diseases and imbalances in so much of society because we are denying and rejecting a huge part of ourselves and we were born to be super ecstatic, super sexually alive, Mm. super vibrant. And so when we shut down that expression in ourselves, a part of us dies Mm. and that's so deeply and profoundly unhealthy. Mm. Mm. And I have basically dedicated my life to eradicating unnecessary suffering and hearing you say that, it's just like how much unnecessary suffering has been the result of us being divorced from our own divinity, divorced from these realms of ecstasy and pleasure inside of us because somewhere we believe the lie that they were wrong or bad or dirty. And so I want to just say thank you for your lifetime of work of reminding people not only of their own sovereignty, but that God can be found, that God, that they are God actually, but that's a big concept to digest. So first we have to sort of like, you know, look at it or feel moments of it. Like you had when you had the activation or you would in a sacred sexuality practice. So, and here's something I would like to say really quick, because Mm -hmm. this is, this this is where the key is. Every religion has beauty and truth in it. Mm -hmm. It's when people take it and say, I know truth and you don't, Mm -hmm. and you have to listen to me. Mm -hmm. There is a huge difference between that And I want to give you the tools and practices to know truth for yourself. So I could be wrong, right? I can be totally misled and totally off base. And, you know, all of this is coming through my own human filter. Mm -hmm. So my desire is to give us enough curiosity to look deeper and then to encourage all of you listening to engage in spiritual practices that aren't telling you Everything's like this. They're telling you, hey, it could be like this. Mm -hmm. Try this out 
and discover for yourself because you are actually that wise, because mm-hmm. you are actually that powerful, because you don't need anyone else. You might have guides, which is very valuable, people who have gone farther on the path, good teachers, good mentorship, good leadership, Community. absolutely, support, safety, all of that, holding and guidance along the path. But that is very different than if you don't believe what I say, you are wrong. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm encouraging is for everyone listening not to accept what we're saying because all that does is make us another class of the same priest, but to look at no religion is bad and wrong, but where do religions get distorted when they start to take your power away from your own deep true knowing and regardless of what religious tradition you're in, what is required so that you can get back to that mystical core of power and wisdom within you. Oh, so well said. So well said. It's like, you know, there's the, um, the phenomenon where you hug someone and you have a surge in consciousness. Yeah. Um, there's you know, thousands of people will wait in line to hug Amma, the hugging guru. Yeah. And there's beauty in that. Like sometimes we want to get a hit of someone else's amazing flavor of God. Um, I love reading Glennon Doyle because I love the way she channels God through her writing. So yeah. it's, it's not about not seeing the divinity in other people. It's just knowing that you also have access to it. It's like yeah. democratizing our access to God versus like, well, everyone has to go through this one place to this one person and they're telling you right and wrong. Yes. Rather than like, I trust my body. I know how to listen to my body and my body will, will gear, gear, will lead me towards what is my next step in evolution. Yes. Yeah. Beautifully, beautifully said. So how, ha, how have these practices, how living a tantric life had the most impact for you personally? And because I know you came from a, a childhood of sexual abuse that you've very bravely and publicly shared about, which I know has helped so many people to name and to heal from their own trauma and abuse. And there's so much sexual trauma in the world right now that I think just simply naming it in itself is a powerful medicine so that people don't feel so alone. Mm-hmm. And then I'll, I'll just mirror back to you that one of the things that I see so powerfully both in your transmission and in your friendship is your willingness and your bravery to go directly into the pain, directly into the darkness and to hold it with so much love. Mm -hmm. And that has been a theme that's been coming up in episode after episode is that all of the pain, all of the fear that's stuck in our body actually just needs and is requiring love. And it's one of the things that I've seen you do with yourself. It's one of the things that I appreciate so much about our friendship is that when I'm at my lowest, when I'm at my most scared, my most sad, that you not only have the capacity, which is rare, but you have the training and the insight and the trust of your own body to hold the bigness of my suffering with so much love. And so thank you for that. And I'd love to know like how these tantric practices have helped you the most. Yeah. Well, I think you're touching on, on something that's, that's so important, right? Which is if we're carrying the worldview that this world is about, this life is about being in as much life and goodness as possible only, then we want to cling to the elevated experiences, to the goodness. But what happens is we're denying or rejecting or disconnecting from a huge part of life, right? And so one of the things that I think is so powerful about the tantric tradition is in their goddess pantheon, there's many different lineages of tantra, but in one of the lineages, um, they worship the Mahavidyas. So these are 10 expressions of Shakti, 10 expressions of the goddess. And there are very pure expressions of love and compassion, right? So you could think of Tara as a form of that. Then there are forms of expression that are playful and sexy and 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 light, right? So Tripura Sundari, um, Lalita, the one who plays, right? She's very youthful. Then there's also Kali, right? Which those of us who do yoga have usually encountered, right? It's it's wrathful, right? Kali is blue or black in the tradition, right? Her tongue is out because she is the force of awakening when Kundalini first activates and your full unconscious starts to become conscious, right? There's also Dumavati, who's in her 80s or 90s. She has fangs and she likes to be worshipped in a graveyard and she wants her worshippers to be impure when they come to her. And so what it does is it opens up this field for us to 
re-understand that goddess isn't just shiny, beautiful, sexy fertility, right? Like Aphrodite, for instance, or Venus, or only Lakshmi in the Hindu tradition. That goddess is literally everything. Goddess is purity. Goddess is compassion. Goddess is life, but goddess is also death. Goddess is also impurity. Goddess is also rage. Goddess is everything. She'll give you everything. She'll take everything away. <laughs> and so when, when there is an, un, an embodied understanding of that, shadow and pain are some of the greatest teachers of life, but you can also be intimate with them. So something that I teach in Vita is your, Vita is your coaching certification where you train people to be sex, love, and relationship coaches. Which, yeah, mm-hmm. it's my methodology. So mm-hmm. it's a vital and integrated tantric approach to sex, love, and relationships is how intimate can you be with these experiences? So usually inside of us, we have a kind of like, I'll be intimate with my intelligence. Mm-hmm. I'll be intimate in moments where I feel like I'm doing good or someone is loving me, right? Mm-hmm. Some of us are terrified to be intimate with our own greatness. Some of us are terrified to be intimate with our own joy. Some of us are terrified to be intimate with our own pleasure, right? Some of us are really good at being intimate with our joy. Like I'm very comfortable. Like if I am feeling joy, I'll like get in there, you know? Some of us are intimate with our own sadness, but a lot of us, as soon as we're sad, we want to leave. We want to stop it. We want to stop ourselves from crying, right? Yeah. Many of us are so not intimate with our rage. We're like, I don't ever feel anger. Whenever I meet people who are like- That was me in my first therapy session. My therapist took one look at me and he was like, oh, you are a strong, angry woman. And I was like, no, I'm not. I don't feel angry. I don't get mad. (laughs) Totally. I know enough in my work to be like, that's the most rageful bitch in the class right now. (laughs) She's going to beat the shit out of a pillow at some point and we're all going to cheer. You know? A little tear running down my cheek because I'm like, get it. And- (laughs) Not wrong. (laughs) So for me, there can be this esoteric, yes, it's all goddess consciousness. But for me, that's a way of saying everything is worthy of our intimacy. What if life was worthy of our intimacy, of our Mm. love, life itself? And so every emotion, what if we were intimate with it? Right? What does that mean? Like, how could I be intimate with my sadness? How could I be intimate with my rage? Totally. So it's like, you know, the feeling of wanting to move into an experience like, like my being. Like he cute. Ah, yes. Well, actually I use that. So like, you know, when you have a giant crush on someone mm-hmm. and you just want to be with them mm-hmm. and you like can't stop yourself. And like, there's actually a part of you that would hide in the bushes outside of their house <laughs> if you could maybe. And so it's like that, right? Mm-hmm. Versus when you're repulsed and you're like, get away. I don't want to be around you. All of that. Right. So mm-hmm. when you think that feeling of like, I've got a crush on you. Like I could lick your skin. Like it's so good. You want to move towards that person, Mm -hmm. right? There are feelings inside of our body that we want to move towards, that we want to be intimate with rather than disconnected from. And I actually use that movement because usually when we don't want to be intimate with a part of ourselves, the movement is to go up into our heads. So most of us have received the conditioning of like, I don't want to be intimate with any part of me. Same for me. When I first went to like, spiritual coaching therapy when I was in my early twenties, they were like, Layla, what do you feel in your body? And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, I don't, I don't feel my body. No, why would I feel that uncomfortable bastion of pain and trauma and complication, mm-hmm. you know? And that's something I just want to highlight for people who would be scared of doing this work, people who feel totally divorced of their own pleasure, people who have had a trauma background. I just want to like use you as a shining example. And like one in three sorry, one in four humans on the planet have had some form of sexual abuse. And so it's like, how can we know that and still choose to lean in, choose to do that healing work? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. (sighs) Whoa. So in that, there's this, can I learn to be intimate with myself? Yeah. And sometimes people are like, but that's a problem. I'm too angry. I'm too sad. I'm, I'm too overwhelmed by the heavy emotions. What I've found is that there is a subtle attachment to those or rejection of those internally, but not a true intimacy. So I reject those sort of darker feelings, but I don't, I don't want to be intimate with them. I don't want to love them. Yes. Okay. I don't want to accept them as a deep part of reality. So oftentimes 
in that resistance, they become very entrenched in our nervous system. Yeah. And then actual embodied release and communion with them will allow the intelligence of our body mind to digest those experiences mm. because we weren't built to carry around rage and grief and sadness. We were built to feel those things, but not to carry them around. Mm -hmm. Our body wants to release them. The same as if you get a cut, your body heals the cut. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything, but for us to actually heal the rage and grief and sadness and fear and disgust that is inside of us, even things like self-loathing, our entirely intelligent immune systems, digestive systems of our mind body need to be able to be activated so that they can heal those experiences, that they can integrate those experiences because we've been systematically taught not to embody our emotions, not to be in full active movement, right? Like if you think of like what we would want to do at a funeral, if we were really going to process the grief, well, right? Scream, cry. Be, feel it. Punch the pillows. In mm. loving communion with our community, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The funerals I've been to in my family, silent. People quietly wiping tears, mm -hmm. right? It's especially in white traditions. Totally. In in black America, I got I had the beautiful opportunity to go. Um, there was a woman named Maggie who was basically like my second mother. Yeah. She was with my family from the moment that my mom was pregnant with my sister until I was 16 years old. So like over 20 years, she was yeah. with me every single day. She was black. And when she passed away, her family invited my, my mom and sister and I to be at her house. We rode in the limousine to the, to the church. And she had been a member of this church since she was a little girl. Like she used mm -hmm. to ride a horse mm -hmm. to this church. And this is the daughter of an enslaved person in the South and so you can just feel the collective trauma, the inherited trauma in the room and, and the way that the mourning happened. She was such a respected elder of the church. She was one of the founding members of the church and the, the grieving, the ecstasy, that was the ecstatic grief that was in that room. And there was one girl who was eight years old. And so even the adults, while much more liberated than most of the funerals that I have been to, um, and feeling and having this catharting, which I don't think is a word, but it totally should be. Um, <laughs> but this little eight-year-old girl didn't give a fuck. She was just like full screaming, full wailing, shaking her body. And I was just watching her like school. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Please keep that frequency. Please yeah. remind us yes. of what is true. Yeah. And, you know, as you're listening, you're like, but, you know, I wouldn't want to do that in the supermarket. No, that's why we need held spaces. Mm-hmm ritual spaces, or you could think of them as therapeutic spaces where we can actually process and digest, but we've actually locked down our bodies mm -hmm. out of fear because once you unlock your body, you're super close to having an ecstatic orgasm. <laughs> you're super close to your energy body fully activated, right? And yeah. because we've been so conditioned not to touch that state of liberation, mm -hmm. we've also been conditioned not to fully feel our emotions, not yeah. to fully feel ourselves. So as we get intimate with reality, we'll start to touch the truth of our own being because being intimate with your emotions will unlock your energy body. It will <sighs> unlock your eroticism. So yeah. that's why in the Vita method, it's like, a holistic teaching. It's like, I can't just teach you to feel your emotions because the moment you feel your emotions, you're going to unlock your energy. The moment you unlock your energy, you're going to realize how deeply orgasmic and ecstatic you are. Like as soon as you unlock that, you're going to start to remember that you are God, right? And so how do we create a foundation of self-love, of self-reverence, of a philosophy, be it tantric or not, that can hold and guide you through that awakening process that is true to you so that we can go into sovereign remembrance of this beauty and magic that we were born to experience. Oh, yes. That is, it is our birthright. And it just feels like, it's almost like the, the gift, and this is definitely my judging the light as good and the dark as bad, but it feels like it's like the deeper into the agony that you are willing to go, the more you're willing to excavate that, you're creating space for more ecstasy, more bliss, more joy. Yes. And if we can love both of them with equal measures and find some level of equanimity, like this is where true bliss and enlightenment lies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And like there's such a truth in the tantric and Taoist traditions, right? I think there's a quote, and I'm definitely going to paraphrase it, but it's like when you move beyond attachment to pleasure and pain, 
the whole universe unlocks, right? Mm. You, you, you receive the bounty of everything. And I have found that because if you're listening and you're like, okay, I'm going to get really intimate with like rage and sadness is the point to just have this like really intensely sad and angry life. The point is to be able to be with life. Mm-hmm. And be if with you what re- is. Yeah. And if you really think about it, there, there's no way you're escaping. You, you couldn't not feel sadness in the rest of your life. You wouldn't even want to. You could not feel angry, right? It would be scary if you couldn't have an anger mechanism to your children being threatened or your boundaries being violated, right? Mm -hmm. It's very healthy and normal to feel those experiences. You are going to experience loss and death, right? You're going to experience heartbreak, hopefully, (laughs) right? You would experience all those things, especially if you were living, especially if you were connecting, right? So to make peace with those, to be able to be intimate with those, what happens then is then we could truly unlock ourselves to receive the majesty and goodness of this universe, to be in deep gratitude, to receive the gift of our own life, which Mm. is so profound. And I know that's not a popular opinion right now because we're really in a, a cultural space of looking at everything that's wrong. And I can celebrate and embrace that as a tantrika. And I feel and know what is available to us, an internal heaven on earth. Yes. But like the funniest, I mean, you could think of it as like a cosmic joke. It's not like funny, ha ha. It's like a cosmic joke is that the path to all that pleasure, the path to all of that bliss and gratitude is actually through the shadow. And when you have a cur- the courage to go through the shadow, mm-hmm. what happens is there's a whole new level of light available to you on the other side that doesn't come through rejecting the shadow. It comes through falling in love with it. It comes through having such a deep crush that you would hide in the fucking bushes of your own grief and sadness and pain being like, please come out. And then when you do, <laughs> I'm going to make love to you. <laughs> seducing your pain, seducing your grief. Ah. And so I know that you are going to stick around in a moment and give us a little VIP after party of how to do just that, how to actually start to love and accept these more difficult emotions so that we can unlock greater ecstasy and maybe let go of some of the shame around the darker emotions and the shame around some of the pleasure practices. So I'm really excited for that. Um, Last few questions as we start to bring it home. I would be remiss if I let this whole interview go and didn't ask you about your meditation practice. pre and post Ziva. Um, You know, I know that you studied many different lineages with many different teachers. And I would just love if you'd be willing to share a little bit about our work together, about how it shifted or if it shifted your daily practice. Absolutely. Um, So I first learned to meditate, um, you know, actually right after my 19th birthday, I went and did a 10 day Vipassana. And that's always been my style, like from... (laughs) Going no deep. meditating Going to just like give me a 10 day style boot camp <laughs> where I have to get up at like three 30 in the morning or four in the morning and like meditate for 12 ten, hours a day hours. It is a lot of days. And <laughs> you want me to not move for an entire hour and learn that like pain can be a portal to anything. So I don't have to reject it. Sure. Right. So meditating for a long time, did 10 years of spiritual practice on and off in Asia And, uh, then also when I came back to the U S had access to all the apps, the headspace and the, you know, the meditation trainings that are online and things like that. And the one thing I could never manage to do in all of that time meditating, and I still have some level of spiritual teacher shame embedded when I say this (laughs) is get my own damn meditation practice. (laughs) Like I can pay someone to make me meditate Mm -hmm. and I would do it when I'm on a retreat, but you didn't do it in your daily life. Yes. I could do it. And community. I could do it if my friends wanted to meditate, but I couldn't get myself to just get up and meditate every morning. And I wanted that. I hungered for it. And it was actually a few years that I was getting the message. Like, this is what you need to do. Like you need to be meditating every day. Like it's essential Mm -hmm. for you. And I like, couldn't get it. And you were like, Hey, I'll give you the Ziva initiation, not related to that necessarily, but just because we co-initiate each other Mm -hmm. in our bodies of work. And so you came and uh, gave me the Ziva initiation and I received my specialized mantra and the training in the 20 minute practice a day. And you were like, you can't drink caffeine. And I was like, go to hell. And- <laughs> like hard, hard boundary for me. <laughs> One of the best, I mean, so many great Emily Fletcher moments because she was just like, Layla, please like just get up and meditate in the morning and don't drink caffeine. And so I texted her and I was like, I just finished my Ziva meditation and I'm on my third coffee. (laughs) And she texted me, may the coffee gods have mercy on your soul. (laughs) 
If I had three cups of coffee before my meditation, I would have to go straight to the psych ward. Yeah. Like, but this is why, you know, different strokes for different folks. Every nervous system is different. So this is why we don't want to be dogmatic. <laughs> I'll give you the initiation and you do with it what you will. <laughs> I was like, you can fry my morning ass coffee out of my cold, dead, <laughs> previously meditating hand. And so <laughs> what happened is I received your specific transmission, received your mantra. And since then, and I, I believe it's been over a year now, like close to a year and a half since that mm-hmm. initiation, um, I love meditating. Mm. And I have been through whole stretches, like months at a time where I have meditated twice a day Mm. in the Ziva tradition. Mm -hmm. And I have never actually fully fallen off the horse. I don't Mm. think since that initiation, I have gone a whole week without meditating Mm. on my own. And oftentimes I meditate many times a week. Um, I love it when I do the twice a day. The twice a day is more rare for me, but the once a day I can really, really nail Mm -hmm. and I crave meditation. I want Mm -hmm. to do it. I look forward to doing it on the plane. I look forward to doing it in the morning Mm -hmm. today when I didn't have time to do it. uh, When we woke up in the morning, I felt sad, right? Mm -hmm. So meditation has become pleasurable to me. Mm -hmm. It's become something I want to do. It's become a cherished part of my life more than anything else. I do believe that transmission has deep value, mm. right? Your transmission of meditation awoke in something in me that allowed me to have a deeper dedication, a deeper relationship to meditation in my life. It has completely and utterly changed my life. It is a sanctuary. It is a refuge for me, the mm. Ziva meditation practice. Mm. It calms me. It, it, it makes me feel like I can do my work better because I can meditate ahead of time. It makes me feel like I can be in my relationship better because if I start freaking out, I can do my meditation. And that's another thing that you gave me is not only this ability to meditate regularly, but a feeling of meditation as sanctuary, Mm. as peace, because you teach it in such a relaxed way Mm. that like, instead of being like, I have to meditate and like, you know, it's like, I get to, I get to meditate. It's a privilege. Mm. And that's something, it wasn't something you said. It was something you transmitted. Ah, Layla, thank you so much. I'm so, it makes me so happy to know that this work and these practices have have helped to give your nervous system rest and resourcing to fuel this very, very important fire that you are bringing to the earth. Um, I love you so much. Thank you for this, this transmission today. Thank you for the countless ways that you have changed my life, made it more fun, more playful, more ecstatic, reminded me of my own true divine nature, taught me through our friendship to love deeper, the darker parts of myself. I love you. Um, I would love where, if people, I'm sure people are going to be like, where do I find more of this woman? I want to dive into her work. Um, Where would be the best place for people to start to work with you? LaylaMartin.com. And Mm -hmm. we have many of the practices that you and I have discussed for free on my website. I highly recommend uh, getting on my email list because it is not just emails. (laughs) It is primo content. (laughs) It's truly like every word of every sentence is like, it is so entertaining, so enlightening. Truly every email is a gift. Our email sender, provider, whatever, they were like, how do you guys have such high open rates? And I was like, they were like, we've never seen this, but like people read your emails and it truly is. Um, I love pouring my heart and soul of these teachings. So if you get on my email list, you receive tantric practices, you're going to receive my podcast, but also I write very regularly about my tantric journey, about Mm -hmm. my um, tantric life, my tantric life which is the name of your new podcast as well. Which I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I have created also a podcast, This Tantric Life. And again, it's it's the sharing of these practices, these tools, this tradition, but also how to take that deep wisdom and philosophy of Tantra and apply it because everything that we experience, right? Like, I, I don't know that we've touched on it in this as much as we could, but like, we love our lives. No. Oh. Like we really actually love our lives. Like our and lives are really great. We actually say it out loud. We're like, we're the luckiest. What? And like we our, have the most amazing parties and playtime and love and sharing and depth. And like community. we do life together. We do the heart. I was there for you for your divorce. You have been there for me in my hardest moments. And we celebrate the hell out of life. We have so much fun. Our sauna session was like so epic. And we come up with life-changing ideas. And we get to be erotic and magical. And we do sex magic in the most random of places. And like, <laughs> it's so good. And, and everyone can live that way. 
You can mm-hmm. live your own version of that. I don't even like sharing that expression on my own Instagram because I don't want people to feel shame if they're not there. Mm. And this tantric life and everything you're teaching, honestly, is meant to be a portal for people to fall in love with their lives that way, for you to fall in love with your life that way in your own version. Yeah. It will look different. It will look unique to you. But mm-hmm. to give yourself the permission, the energy activation, the empowerment so you can live life according to your rules and your desires and that kind of like mm, I love my life that's what both of us want you to have and mm-hmm. that's what this tantric life podcast wants you to have that's what my website wants you to have mm-hmm. so like get over there if you feel called get over there yeah. <laughs> laylamartin.com I am enrolled right now in her Vita coaching certification and this is for people who want to either add that certification into their professional practice yeah. or step into a coaching career but you also have programs that are not um, just professional trainings like there's Vita Sacred Sexuality mm-hmm. and that's for everything you have a men's program mm-hmm. men's sexual mastery yeah. Oh Bliss yeah. um, so there's many different mod- modalities and many different portals in but at the very least go get on her email list subscribe to her podcast I'm going to be a guest tomorrow morning Ow! <laughs> um, all right so last question um, and this is going to help us to transition into the beautiful teaching that you have very kindly offered to gift to our folks. But if you could install one code into the species, mm. what would it be? Erotic liberation. Erotic liberation. Erotic liberation. Great. Yeah. And so it is. Yeah. Layla Martin, I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you so much for spending your most valuable resource with us, your time and your attention. I trust that you have learned so much from this enlightened teacher for my dear friend. If you have enjoyed this episode, please do share it on your Instagram stories. Tag us at Layla Martin, at Ziva Meditation. If you're enjoying this episode, if you wanted to subscribe, maybe even leave a review, that would be so awesome. And check us out for more deeper teachings at zivameditation.com slash why this. As you can tell, Layla has so much to offer. So if you would like deeper teachings from folks like Aubrey Marcus, Layla Martin, Blue, that's where you can find us, zivameditation.com slash why this. I love you and we'll see you next time. Oh, also just in case you're just watching this, I do want to just do a quick shout out for Layla's new company, which she created called Mood, where she's made these amazing, amazing plant activated um, supplements that help you to access your own sensuality, your own play, your own sex magic, and your own ecstasy. These are, these are not like narcotics. These are plant derived from the earth and they are outrageously powerful. So check them out. It's launching like now. Yep. Shopmood.com. Shopmood.com. They're so powerful and they're so different. So I'm excited for you to try these out and let us know uh, how it feels to fill your body with the pleasure of mood. 